Good evening, church. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Colin, the pulpit minister here at Central Church of Christ. And this is Dan Spaeth. He's one of our elders. And here at Central Church of Christ, it's our mission to be God's heart and hands in this community and beyond. If you'd like to learn more about what that means, I want to encourage you to head over to our website at www.churchvictoria.com. This is our Wednesday evening conversation through the law and the prophets where we open up the Old Testament. We move through the narrative and the text and we see how it impacts us today as the church and how it how that text connects to Jesus. Um, if you're listening Listening to this on the Heart and Heads podcast. I want to thank you so much for joining us. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and you have the bell turned on so you get notified every time we upload a video. And if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure to like and share. That really helps us out. And make sure to comment down below. Um, if this ministry has blessed you or you'd like to partner with us in this ministry, I want, I want to encourage you to head over to that website. At the top of the page, we have a donate button that uh, take, will take you to PayPal, and you can partner with us as we seek to teach and preach the gospel. Uh, we're going to pray and get into the lesson. Again, church, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. It's good to be back. It is good to be back, man. It was, it's been a long time, seemed like. seemed like forever since we sat here. It's been a couple yeah. months. Yeah, it's uh, it's good. I hope you guys in, are uh, are take. I, I have a couple people tell me, you know, man, they can't wait for it to start again. You know, so here we go. We're going to get off and we're going to get into numbers and. Well, we have so much content at this point recorded. You know, mm -hmm. we started doing all this during COVID, mm -hmm. and so we got so much content at this point recorded that. You know, there's no reason why we can't go back and say, hey, you know, we need to take a couple of months. You know, I had I had some things to finish up and, and get done yep. with. And so take a couple of months and let's wait and then let's show yep. some of that older stuff. And yep. so and it's good. You know, the I am the class that you did with James, the I am statements are very good. So they're long, which yeah. is which is yeah. probably the, we, the biggest we, fault. At this that's point. one of the things that we've done is we've toned this thing down. Short. Yeah. You know, so. But hey, it's good. We gotten started. We're going to start Numbers chapter 1. We're going to be in Numbers uh, chapter 1. Let's pray and we'll get started. Yeah, let's do it. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have uh, to teach this class. We pray your blessings upon us as we do this. We pray for our audience, whoever is listening, whenever they will listen. And we pray, Father, your, your blessings upon them because of what we do this, this, this evening. Father, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the power of it. And thank you for the ability that we have to to be able to navigate through it and the freedom we have to do this. Father, just bless us as we go through this study. And uh, and thank you for bringing us back to it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I think uh, before we jump into numbers, I think it's important to remind everyone, you know, this isn't going to be a verse-by-verse -verse study. No, um, can't do that. We Now, we say that, and then oftentimes we get into verse-by-verse. -verse. So it we're not saying it isn't, and we're not well, saying it is. Well, the problem here is... is for a, the biggest majority of these chapters, this one chapter, is just nothing but a bunch of names. Well, and so, and that brings us to the reason why we don't do verse by verse. So, yeah. if your Bible, yearly Bible reading plan survived the butchering of Leviticus, right? You get into Numbers thinking, Lord help me, let's get back into the story, and you're immediately confronted with the riveting literature of census data. <laughs> Yeah. So and so if you if your Bible yearly Bible plan survived Leviticus, numbers puts a bullet in it. Mm -hmm. And so that's difficult. It's this we're we're dealing with very difficult stuff. It's important stuff, but it is well, difficult. Our job, I think, is to is to is to uplift the 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 reason for really studying this. Sure. Yeah. What's the importance of it? Yeah. Why do I need to navigate through it? Now there's some stuff, you know, there, you can you can cut over the names and all that stuff and just jump into the into the next chapter or the end of the first chapter and and not deal with all the names. But there's some things we're going to bring out, yeah, that are in, are significant and important in yeah. in this stuff. You know, I mean, it it is important. It's not that it's not important. Yeah, but um, you may not understand what the importance is as you just read through it. And like you said, you, you know, Leviticus just wiped you out, and now you get a bullet in the head with numbers. Man. Well, it. Okay, so we it's the Word of God. I believe it's the Word of God. I Absolutely. believe it's significant. Absolutely. But we also have to remember that we are not the primary intended recipients no. of these no. of these writings. No. Um, it's just that's the fact. We're not. You know, it's like when you go to it was not written to us. Right. Yeah. If you go to if you go to First or Second Timothy, right? Those letters were meant from Paul to Timothy. Yes. And at the end of uh, I think First Timothy, Paul's like, "Hey, uh, I forgot all this stuff over there. Could you bring it to me?" Yeah. You know, we don't read that and go, "Oh, I got to go find all yeah. the stuff no. Paul forgot." You know, so. And I t and I tell I'm teaching First Timothy, and I tell him all the time. I said, "This doesn't wasn't written to you." 
it, it wasn't. Really not. You can, there's some things we can learn from it, but it yes. wasn't written to us. I mean, there are amazing lessons to be learned, and that's true for this literature too. So yeah. when we read through, as we're moving through this census information, the question that we ought to be asking is, what significance does this have for us today? What yeah. what is what is is what, there what, any significance? Is there any significance? Yeah. What what and and I think there is, mm -hmm. um, but what is it? And so we're we're going to talk about well, all I that. Well, I think I think the first part of it, you know, we we've alluded to this already before when we were in Leviticus. Yes. To this first le to this first verse. Yeah, if Lee, if you could bring up Leviticus one one, um, just let me know when you're there. But you know, Leviticus one one and Leviticus or Numbers one one kind of dovetail each other very mm -hmm. nicely mm -hmm. here. And remember, and we're gonna go, we're gonna talk about why, right? So God brings. Well, each we we connected that a little bit before when we were correct. in Leviticus. Yeah. But you know, we told we were gonna go back to it when we got to Numbers chapter one. Mm -hmm. So remember the story. You know, they went, Israel and his sons went down to Egypt to survive the famine. And then uh, they ended up becoming slaves of Pharaoh. And, and Pharaoh decided he was going to destroy him. And then Moses gets chosen to lead them out. Mm -hmm. And so he leads them out. He leads them into Mount Sinai. Well, that's Exodus, right? So Exodus is them coming out of Egypt, the Israelites coming out of e uh, Egypt, mm -hmm. coming into the wilderness, getting to Mount Sinai. And then that's kind of where the story pauses. And then the latter half of Exodus and all of Leviticus and up to Numbers chapter 11 is all at Mount Sinai. Yeah. Um, at the mountain of God. Yeah. Right? So and they're not, still not ready to leave yet. They're still not. And they're not going to leave till Numbers chapter 11. Yeah. So that's that's an important thing to understand. Yeah. We're, we're still at the foot of Mount Sinai. God is still organizing these people because there was a problem. And that was Exodus chapter uh, 12, 32 with the golden calf. Yeah. So... Remember, the people of Israel are standing down there at the mountain, or sit, dan, standing down at the bottom of this mountain. Moses and Joshua have gone up the mountain, uh, and, and think, they, they create an idol. I think it's important for us to keep re going back and reminding. These people mm -hmm. are living in real time. That's right. right. Yeah. They're living in day-to-day, -day, week to week, month to month. And they this that that for us, the golden calf may have been a long time ago, because it was a long time ago. Not for them. For them it was they they've just buried some folks that died. Yeah. They that that is that is a really nasty taste in their mouth still and god's still talking to him about it it hadn't gone away for him either that's right it hasn't you know now he's put all of Le leviticus together to get them to this point where that's they right. can leave right after they have they have violated you know no they they shattered the covenant oh well, they, they broke it they, they fully bro broke it they broke it they broke it you know it's funny because when we talk about the ten commandments and it wasn't just the ones that died they all did it right yeah Absolutely. The whole nation did it. So when we t when we talk about the Ten Commandments, what we realize going through Leviticus, when we start looking at that sacrifices and stuff, is for some of breaking for some of those idolatry, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, worshiping other gods. There isn't a sacrifice for that. If you commit that, you're you're, dead. you're supposed to be dead. You're, you're supposed, supposed to be, be like stoned or dragged out of the camp, mm -hmm. killed, left left behind, yeah. that type of thing. Uh, murder, adultery. There is no. There isn't no. any a sacrifice no. for this. No, you die. So. People look at David later on, David and Bathsheba, right? And, when and, David, you know, and that, and you look at Jesus with the woman that's caught in adultery, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and he, and you see that you see the switch because the law says she's dead, yeah, and he duels on the and and he has he changes the narrative. Well, I mean, it's but it's all the way back in with yeah. in the Old Testament with yeah. David. Because David commits adultery, David commits murder. He does these things. He yeah. murders his his buddy Uriah was. Kill him. Yeah, you're, well, Uriah was one of the thirty, one of his captains, one yeah. of his men. That's yeah. you know you're, he invites Uriah one to of the his palace. Faithful men. Yeah, and the the reason that relationship is there, and so not only does David know Uriah and know Bethsheba, but he's well acquainted with them. See, we we miss a lot of that in the text because it doesn't recap that because they would have known. Yeah. And so this is one of his buddies. This is one of his homies. Mm -hmm. And David stabs him in, the, him in the back, murders him, and then takes his wife. I mean, it's as, as horrible as it gets. Yeah. And yet David is forgiven. Yeah. Well, people look at that story and go, well, why David? Why is David forgiven? What's special about him? You're missing the point. This God has done this with Israel multiple times. Because yeah. if you go all the way back to the golden calf, right when the covenant kicked off, God's doing the same thing. He's forgiving Israel, even though he there is no Moses, sacrifice. He told Moses, move out of the way, and I'll make of you a great nation. That's he, right. He, he said, I, I'm going to start over. Except for the intercessor. So, The I, intercessor, it's, it's, Moses. It's the intercessor, And we Moses. talked about it. And just like now, what could God do? Look around our creation today. Look around. What's go, what does Jesus do? He says, I got this. I'll take care of it. So we, we've hit on a couple of themes, but the one that we're, we're kind of focusing on is, 
how does God deal with sin in the camp? And the answer is with grace. Yeah. And it's and that's pretty consistent with throughout grace. the Old Testament yeah. and throughout the New Testament. And so here we are in Numbers, right? Having them broken the covenant in Exodus chapter 32, Nadab and Abihu drunk off their, their butts, walking into the most holy of holies whenever they wanted to. So, I mean, still violating yeah. stuff. Yeah. And this is on the day of atonement, Leviticus 9. So look at look at Leviticus 1. Lee, I know you've got it pulled up already. Uh, I was going to pull it up. I hadn't, I hadn't grabbed it yet. But um, I can read it. Yeah, read it for me. So the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, and he, and he goes on. So in Leviticus 9, that's when the Day of Atonement occurs. The, the description of the Day of Atonement is in Leviticus 16, right in the dead center of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. right, of the first five books, okay? It's the linchpin. Mm -hmm. That's where your transition. You yep. peak in Leviticus 16 mm -hmm. in these five books. Mm -hmm. But here in uh, Leviticus 9, they enter back into the Ten of Meeting. Yep. And now here in Numbers 1.1, 1, 1, Lee, if you get over to Numbers 1.1 1, 1 for me, uh, it says, the Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting. So now we've gone from Leviticus 1.1 1, 1 from Leviticus 9. They sacrifice and they're back in to Numbers 1.1. 1, 1. We're picking up here and now we're back in the this, tent of this meeting. This is all about God restoring favor to the people. Restoring relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. Because in, in Leviticus 1.1, 1, 1, he Moses is not allowed in the temp, in, the, in the tent. God's in the tent mm -hmm. and speaks to him from the tent. Yep. Here, Moses now goes into the tent yep. and God speaks to them inside, right. which is yeah. significant because now there's a bringing back of the relationship. Right. This yeah. is what Jesus did on the cross, guys. This is what he did when he came out of the tomb. He yeah. restores relationship through grace and mercy. Absolutely. Well, and it, and it always it always makes me laugh. Whenever I hear, it makes me laugh, it makes me cry a little bit, but it, it always it always makes me pause when I hear someone say, well, God is is out to get me, or yeah, God is my no. enemy, or no. God is, it's like, you, you really don't know what God has done then if you think yeah. that. Because ever since the beginning, God has consistently worked to save us. Yes. What, what we don't understand, we're like children, we're like toddlers, we think happiness, joy, fulfillment, all comes from getting those cookies in the cookie jar, mm -hmm. right? But God's like, no, you can't have those cookies. There's a reason you can't. Those cookies, those cookies are not as good as you think they are. Yeah. They, you know, they're actually poison, mm -hmm. right? So think of a toddler thinking he wants the candy, mm -hmm. right? That's in the bottom drawer and underneath the sink, mm -hmm. right? It's like what the, we know is that's not candy. It's like the other day, you know, I was talking to Margarita and she may watch this and, and, and her daughter and, and, she had she had pulled her daughter from school and and because of some things and and I looked at her daughter and I said, I said understand something your mom sees things you don't see, yeah your mom ex has experienced things you haven't experienced yet, one day you'll understand, I said but your mom has to make decisions based on what's best for you sure. when you don't think that you need any supervision, and I said one day you'll know when you have to you have to explain it to your own child. And say, I'm going to do this, and you're not going to understand, but I'm going to do it anyway. Well, it's like, why is corporal punishment so effective and important mm -hmm. in a child's life? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why should you do that? What's the, what's the argument for it, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's quite simple. A child's brain is not developed enough for them to be able to reason. Yeah. You and I look at things very differently yeah. than children, even teenagers. A, yeah. a, a kid's brain isn't done developed. I believe it, it about finishes 20, about 20, mid-20s like um, is what they believe now. Yeah. So. But why do you use corporal discipline? Well, you use corporal discipline because a child reasons not based off their frontal cortex, but a, a different part of the brain, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which really only responds to emotional issues. So you have to use some form of corporal discipline to help that child understand things that they're not supposed to use. Or I shouldn't say you have to, but it's the most effective means. Now that doesn't mean that it's okay to abuse a child, it doesn't mean anything, but why are you using that corporal discipline? Because you want to hurt or abuse the child or because you want to help the child understand its boundaries yeah. and things it can do and things it can't do. And this is what God has been doing with his children. Absolutely. Because that's what, is, that's what the nation, that's his children. Today, Jesus has, has done exactly the same thing as Moses, you know, an intercessor for the church. That's right. Because the church is his children. It's his family. It's what First Timothy said. It is the it is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. It is the household of God. 
And this is what God is working towards. Since the garden, mm -hmm. since man fell mm -hmm. and chose rebellion, chose, chose to join in spiritual rebellion with the adversary, since that occurrence and the entrance of sin and death into the world, God has been working not to our harm, but to our benefit, to, our to benefit. save us. Because God is the author of life. We're going we're gonna to get to some, some and horrible... He, and he says, I think in Second Peter, he said... God didn't want anyone to perish. That's right. He wants yeah. everyone to come to repentance. That's right. So the people that, that out there that say, well, you see, God predestined some people and some people, they're just lost. Well, that's garbage. Well, God certainly predestines, but he doesn't predestine people for destruction. He, no. he predestines salvation and redemption. Yeah. Um, that's, as, a, as a whole. So predestined just means God's working out but his plan. But there are plan. people out there that say, right. well, you see, you just had, you had, you've had everything given to you. Well, God, God. God probably right. set you aside to be saved anyway. So yeah. that, that's true. I've heard that argument. That's and that's a that's a misunderstanding of what the word predestination means. Mm -hmm. So I've run into people who think that about predestination, and I've run into people who think predestination doesn't exist in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So predestination certainly exists. It does. Says God, it does. God is all predestination means is God working out His plan. Mm -hmm. The question is, what's the plan? Yeah. Right. And that's where people are going to differ a little bit. Sure. But I think what we see throughout the Old Testament, specifically throughout the Old Testament. Is God working out our redemption? Yeah, I think I think something that, you know, this is really significant in verse 1 because now the people have access and they had no access before. This is Because why of what they did, really they had access. They didn't realize it because Moses didn't come down in time when they thought he ought to come down. They make a golden calf and they lose access to God. This is why this is why Leviticus 16 is the linchpin yes. of the Old Testament, yes. right? So you have five books. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Leviticus is right in the middle. And right in the middle of Leviticus 16. It's the dead center. Why? Because it's showing us. And it's about atonement. It is about atonement. It's mm -hmm. showing us how to re-enter into the presence of God. It's yeah. showing us what's going to be required. And it's a shadow. The because Hebrew writer the, says it's because a shadow. The, because the, the Pentateuch, the five books that Moses wrote, that was the, that was the law for them. That was it. That, that is what they, they lived off of. You know, the rest of the books that we have were written, you know, there were prophecies and, you know, the Psalms and stuff. They may have did, but they're, what they really focused on was those five books. I mean, they're, they are the first five books of the Bible, the, the Pentateuch, the Torah, mm -hmm. what comprises the Torah, uh, is going to form the foundation of everything. Everything. Everything, everything else that's to come. Everything. It's, that's it's, why it's so, I had somebody tell me one time and said, well, we don't live under the Old Testament. Why do we have, we, we, we don't even need to read the Old, the Old Testament. And I said, you don't understand. The Old Testament, Romans tells us the Old Testament, you know, that it is it is written, before it was written for our learning. So that we, so the, the encouragement of this scripture, we might have hope. Yeah, it, first, this is encouraging. First Corinthians chapter 10, Paul makes a very similar argument. Um, Jesus knew the Old Testament. If you want to know the Bible that the early church had and used, the answer is the Old Testament. Peter wasn't passing out tracts of no, the New Testament no, at Pentecost. No. Okay. It just, that just didn't happen. Um what the reality, the simple fact is um, the Old Testament formed the understanding of early Christians, and it certainly formed the foundation of Jesus's teachings. That's right. So, you know, the Sermon on the Mount is often looked at, um, is often looked at as kingdom, kingdom principles, or, or this is, this is the message for the people of the kingdom. And uh, it's actually not, it's not. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is a rebuke of rabbinic Judaism, mm -hmm. which developed, you know, maybe 200 BC, 100 BC, up into 200 AD. Well, and so it's it's literally Jesus rebuking the teachings and the understandings of the rabbis of, of what is what mm -hmm. has now become rabbinic Judaism um, of them in that time period, right? So if, if you pay attention, Jesus says right, right at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, your righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees, right? Well, who are the Pharisees? Well, they were the rabbinic teachers. And then what does Jesus say? He doesn't say the law of Moses says. It's not what he says. He says, you have heard that it's been said, do not do this or do not do that. Well, where are they getting do not do that? They're getting it from the Torah, but he's not talking about what the Torah actually says. He's talking about what they've said. He's talking about what they say it says. And, and guys, if you think about this, think about it. There's a lot of things that this book says, especially New Testament stuff, that people are saying out there, well, it says this with no bit basis at all, right. because that's not what the book says. There's a lot of things that I that I see and I hear people saying 
preachers out there. They stand up in front of pulpits and in front, front of 10,000 people and say stuff that is blatantly, patently false. Doesn't, the book doesn't say that, doesn't say right. it like that. You know, and I, and I, you know, we could go all day long on the things that, that are going on out there that people are talking about or doing in a worship service or in, in their whatever. And it does, the book never said that. What's well, the same thing as what Jesus is saying. That's why I tell people when I want them to start studying, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. And read them over and over and over. Because one day when you do have to listen to the Old Testament, you'll say, wait a minute, I've heard this before. Because Jesus will have said, Jesus will have told you this is what it really says. Not what they say, this is what it really says. And that's and that, so the Sermon on the Mount is not about kingdom principles. I mean, it is and it isn't because kingdom principles are eternal. The kingdom values are eternal. Mm -hmm. This is, it, I mean, it's like he says in Mark chapter 10, right? Uh, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, right? Mm -hmm. So the greatest among you will be a servant. Um, it, it, that's not a new Testament principle. That's an old Testament principle. So, but if you don't know the old Testament, if you don't read it, if you don't under, if you don't try to struggle through it and understand it, which I mean, I get it that we're talking well, about, that's why we're here trying to help. That's right. And we're talking about literature that was written thousands and thousands of years ago. So it's very difficult to understand. And it's yeah. been translated whenever you're reading translated. Well, guys, work, I hope, I hope we're making understand. it easier. So, Sometimes we get off on a tangent, but and and this isn't we're not off on a tangent. We're still talking yeah, about numbers. But we one have one. gotten off the tangent we have, before. We have, we have before. But this isn't. And so what we're saying is this: God's eternal purpose that mm -hmm. He is working out is the redemption and salvation of His creation, that is mankind. That's what we're saying. That's what He's working towards. So if you're in a situation and you're thinking, "Well, God just hates me, and I'm being punished." First of all, no, God no. does not hate you. He loves you. Yeah. Are you being punished? Maybe, yeah. but maybe you deserve to be punished. Yeah. Maybe you're not being punished. Maybe what's going on is God wants to use you as an example for something. Or maybe, or, or maybe God is blessing you and you just don't know it. We were talking with a sister the other day and we've been praying and praying and praying for something to happen. And I was, it was with our other elder, Dan, Dan Marshall. And uh, it was me and him and the sister in Christ. And we're, we're, we've been praying for, for probably two years, maybe somewhere around that time, I think maybe a year and a half. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but a long time for something to happen. And it dawned on us while we were sitting there in that meeting, talking and praying, it dawned on us that the true blessing is that God hasn't answered our prayers, that God hasn't given us what we've been asking for. Mm -hmm. And we realized that if, if God had given us what we'd been asking for, this sister would be in a in a world of Did hurt she today. Know that? Yeah, we we talked about yeah, it, and we good. we all came to the same realization. And I'm very grateful that you know God put that elder in that room and and gave yeah, him that insight absolutely. because it it really I mean we've been thinking A and A was actually really bad, and yeah. we didn't realize it. And yeah. and God has been you know it's like we're sitting here praying for this, and the Holy Spirit's interpreting it, going, "Don't give it to him, God. Yeah, don't, don't give it. Don't, give to it. Him. don't do. They don't want this, that. That's not is, where they want to go. Is, they think this is what they the, want." The, and so it really comes back to... It's a great illustration of what God tells us in Romans chapter 8, where the, the, the Holy Spirit intercedes with our spirit. You know, our spirit is saying, we really want this. But this would be, this be so good. And the Holy Spirit is saying, back up just a little bit. We truly are children trying to get at the candy underneath the kitchen sink. Yeah. We think it's candy because we don't understand. Yeah. God knows it's not. God knows it's poison. And God's keeping us from it a lot of times. Yeah. And we don't understand. Yeah. We and then we get upset and angry. I think at God. that's the beauty, Cole, of, of this verse in Numbers Leviticus one of now we have access. And we have access to a father. Think what it would well, there be will come a point when God will be done. There will, yeah. And when he's done, the 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 absolute horror of the separation will be will come full circle and will be, be patently right in our face. What will be the what will be the outcome of absolute God saying, "I'm done, I'm done." Jesus tells us in Second Thessalonians, he tells us that one day he's going to come back. Well, and we're going to see some of it in the Old Testament as we get into, especially here in Numbers, because you know, the, the, so we've been talking about the purpose of God mm -hmm. and His desire to redeem. Well people today are not the first people to look at what God is doing and to second guess it and to assume that he is working towards their destruction. Um, you know, they've seen God, you know, they've seen God, they've seen him on the mountaintop, they've seen him work to their redemption, they've seen all this, they've seen him work to their good. So a lot of people today would say, well, why doesn't God just show up on a mountaintop? Numbers is the, is the reason why, okay? Because he's been there and he's done that. 
And in Numbers, we're going to see what happens when God yeah, takes like, people I, by the hand. I like, I like that because I used to hear that all the time in the jail. How come? Well, how come God just doesn't do this? Right. He already did it. He's been there. He yeah. did it. It didn't work. It didn't, doesn't work. Yeah. It didn't work. Um, so he, he tried it and it he, didn't work. And we're going to see that in Numbers. We would think, because like we said, right, Leviticus, that chapter 16, that day of atonement coming back into the presence of God, lynchpin. Mm -hmm. So now that we've been in the presence of God and we're coming down the other side, and it's really a journey from Eden to Eden, right? Because they were journeying out of Egypt into Eden, into the presence of God. And now they're journeying from Eden. They're going into the wilderness to the promised land, which is another Eden. And yeah. So the point is they're going from Eden to Eden. And the question and, is... And along... explain, explain what you mean by Eden. Right. So so the, the whole point of... The, the whole point of God's work is to get us back into his presence. And, and that is Eden. That, that's that's the symbolic garden of, of the garden. It's symbolic, symbolic of the, of the right. garden. Yeah. So, well, the garden is symbolic of being in the presence yes. of God. Yes. So it's when I say we're going back to Eden, we're going back to the garden. What I mean is we're going, we're, we're moving from Mount Sinai and the presence of God where we've arrived in Leviticus 16, right? We're moving from there out into back into the wilderness, which is in numbers to the land that God has promised, that land that God promised Abraham. And it's here in this land that he's going to um, communicate the blessings that he promised Abraham. It's where he's going to mm -hmm. begin to work out his grace, not just for Israel, but for the whole world, because that's what he wants. Yes. He's got Israel in his presence. And, and you know, when, when we go from that Eden back into the wilderness, all the thing that he's done so far is to help us to navigate how we make it through that back to him. That's right. Yeah. That, that's all about the access. God did that through Jesus. And how do we this do that? This is what that? you need to do. We do it through faith and obedience. Yeah, absolutely. And so the and question... I think, that's, that, I think, you know, that it's so simple to me. Yeah. When I listen to it and when I hear it explained this way, it's so it, it makes so much sense. And it's so difficult for most people so, to understand. And and ha the question isn't... It, it's what, what we're doing is faith and obedience. We're trusting God and then we're obeying him. Mm -hmm. But the, the where we get confused a lot of times is what does obedience look like? And we want to try to put all sorts of, so you'll have some denominations try to put like Old Testament, oh, we got to keep the feast days, you got to keep the Sabbath, right? They'll try to bring in some stuff from the Old Testament into that obedience formula. Yeah. Um, you'll have other people who try to, well, you've got to show up to church every Sunday, you've got to show up every Wednesday, every time the doors are open, you got to take communion, you got to do all those things. So we'll put these these rungs in that obedience ladder. And none of those things are in that obedience ladder. Okay. Um, what's in that obedience la ladder is serve and love. That's, mm -hmm. that's really it. That's really um, it. It's, it's trusting God and loving people. Right. And then you can get into how do you love people? Right. And we, that's a discussion for and another day. All those day. things in the rungs of the ladder are in that, in that narrative. Right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You do all that stuff well, because, because we're going to see, there's a, there's a verse we're going to see in numbers chapter one. We're not going to look at it today, but there's a verse that basically says, and they did, or it's, it's in the first couple of chapters of numbers. Well, and, and it, I, I want to go back just for a second. Sure. I think when we talk about this Eden thing, I don't want to get past that because okay. I think every one of us, everyone that's watching has that Eden moment mm. and then wilderness moment. Oh yeah. And then back to an Eden moment. God wants us to God God wants us to be in the Eden moment with him. all the time all the time with him and that's why he sent Jesus yeah he gave gives us the opportunity because it says in 1 John chapter 1 that if I walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with other folks that do that he said the blood of his son will cleanse me of all my sin that's right that means God has made it possible yeah. for me to stay in the Eden moment yeah oh yeah He's and it's made, not and it's not predicated on perfection. No, it's not. It's See, because he says the next yeah. verse in that text says, and if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. Well, you don't even have to go to the next verse. Just think about it for a second. Mm -hmm. If it's in the light that I receive cleansing of sin. I, I want to leave. If you pull up first John chapter one, verse five through eight and just put, put it, on, it the on the screen, just so they have it. Yeah. So they have it. That's where it's at. If you if if it's in the light that I receive cleansing of sin, mm -hmm. then what must I have in the light? sin yeah it's i mean yeah sorry like yeah. i i if if to if the the entrance if to, if if there's a club okay we're gonna put it in an analogy if if you we all want to go to the eden club we're gonna call it a club okay but the fee to get in is perfection yeah right okay so then to get in the club i gotta be perfect i gotta i gotta be dressed to the nines everything's gotta be yeah. spiffy yeah. perfect polished yeah. no dirt right mm -hmm. okay but i'm in the street covered in dirt Mm -hmm. And the only baths 
in the entire creation, the only showers, the only cleansing stuff is in that club. Is in that club. Then I'm never getting in. I'm never getting I'm in. I'm never getting never in. Getting. Never getting in. But if it's, hey, you come here in the light, and when you're in the light, it's here that you get cleansed. Mm -hmm. You see, yeah. we think of oftentimes the light being, oh, well, to be there, I've got to be perfect. Mm -hmm. no. no. No, no, no. That's the whole point. It's in the light that we encounter the blood of Christ and are consist excuse me, here, are consistently Here he cleansed. says, he says he talks to him in in the tent. In the tent? In the club. Moses didn't stop being a sinner. No, no. He's, and we'll see that, you know, radically down the road. Well, but, you know, the point is, is that, is that God has always, always wanted that relationship with us. That's right. Even here. And right. so all of this that we've already been talking about was to help get this where it needs to be. That's verse right. one, you know, verse one. Verse one is, the two verse ones, Leviticus one and Demers one are, are prayer and prayer. And he doesn't just want Moses with him. He wants all of us. He wants all of us. All of us. And so that's what he's working towards. Yeah. And what we're going to see in numbers is we're going to see a people, Israel, doubt that. Yeah. They're going to doubt that. And, and we'll gonna, bring it up to you guys when we see it. They're going to consistently rebel, mm -hmm. right? They're going to consistently kick against the goat. They're going to look at God and they're going to doubt him and, and his gonna, purpose and, and all those things. they're consistently cry out to God and God's going to always come back. And it's it's really interesting how that's going to work. And yeah. and it's going to climax. And it's it's really cool because every you're going to see everybody fall. You're not just going to see the people of Israel fall. You're going to see them fall. You're going to see the leaders fall. You're going to see Moses and Aaron fall. Right? So it's a complete and total collapse. And right after Moses and Aaron falls, you would think, well, God's going to bring the hammer down. And it's going to be really interesting to see what he does. Yeah. So yeah. we're, we're going to look at all that. But yeah. what I would say is this. If you think God, if you're out there today and you think God is working against you. That's not true. You need to check yourself. Yeah. You, you need don't to, know what you you're talking about. You need to keep watching the episode. Yeah, you really don't know yeah. what you're talking about. You really need to keep watching because we're going to we're going to keep clarifying for you over and over and over that God is not working against you. He's working for you. Yeah. You're always. like a, you're like a child. Yep. And if you yep. always give in to your child, you're not doing your child any favors. No. So there's a reason that no. God God doesn't give you some things. There's a reason God does give you some things. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be saved. Oh, no. That's not what it means. No. It means he, he's provided us with that Eden moment, and we can stay in the Eden moment, oh, even, when the, the even when the wilderness is all around us. We can stay in the Eden moment, or we can choose not to be in the Eden moment at all. What we need to understand is God loves us so much that he is going to give us what we choose. Yeah. And if we choose not him, he'll, he'll give, give it to us. He'll, he'll let us have that. He will let us have yeah. it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we've had to come back to this and to study again. I pray, Father, that, that people understand how, how much you love them mm. and how much that you care about them and how much you work, how hard you work, Father, for their, for their good and not for their, not for their detriment. Father, I pray for, our, for our, our listeners, whenever that might be, that they, this will help them to navigate through the, the, the trauma of their life and to see that, that you are trying to put a, a a thing together where they can have a relationship and access to you. Mm. Father, thank you for that. We know it was because of your son. We know it wasn't because of us, not anything we've done. It's only because of what he's done that we have access to him. And we can be in that tent, in that place of access with you. And we thank you for that, Father. Bless us as we move forward through this study. And it's in the name of your holy son we pray. Amen. Amen.